Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our YWCA virtual town hall on racial inequities in healthcare. My name is Adrian Bracey, and I am the CEO of YWCA Metro St. Louis. Thank you for joining us today. Our mission is eliminating racism and empowering women. And we believe the information shared in this town hall will inform us as to the harm that systemic racism does to our communities. It is so important that we shed the light on these disparities. Our voice matters now more than ever. And collectively, we can make a difference. And now, it is my honor to introduce you to our distinguished panelists for today. Their bios were included in your registration. First, we have Kathleen Holmes, who's the Vice President of Strategic Initiatives for the Missouri Foundation for Health. Then we have Dr. Denise Hooks Anderson, who is an Associate Professor at St. Louis University, as well as a family medicine physician. And then we have Dr. Jamika Woody Cooper, who is a licensed psychologist. Finally, we have our moderator for today, which is Dr. Veta Thompson, who is an Associate Dean of Diversity, Inclusion, and Equality for the Brown School at Washington University. And now, please sit back and enjoy our virtual town hall that is already in progress with Dr. Jamika Woody Cooper. So insomnia is another thing that I see a, a lot in my practice. But if I look at the biggest thing that I see in my practice as a result of COVID-19, it's higher levels of PTSD, which is post-traumatic stress disorder. And we've all watched, when it, especially if you think back to March, when it, it first kind of dawned on us in the United States, like this is serious, we have to do something about it. That came with a lot of media coverage of people who were sick and dying and people who didn't have enough of medical care. And for that, that has really traumatized a lot of people. That's a big concern for a lot of people that I see about if they will be able to get adequate health care if something happens to them, if there'll be enough beds in the hospital, if they'll have adequate insurance coverage. coverage. So those are the types of issues that I see. But I can say overall that COVID-19 has impacted mental health in ways that I think most people don't really think about on a day-to-day -day basis. Great. Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. My name is Kathleen Holmes. I'm Vice President of Strategic Initiatives at Missouri Foundation for Health. MFH is a catalyst for change, working to improve the health of Missourians through partnership, experience, knowledge, and funding. Our work is particularly focused on creating system level change that will help to eliminate health inequities. We've heard already today on this um, great panel um, how we're going to get through COVID, what we're going to have to do to pr uh, protect our health going forward. We've heard about the impact of, of COVID-19 on our mental health. And what I want to talk about is sort of the why. Why are we seeing COVID-19 impact on the Black population, um, in, in particularly in St. Louis, so heavily? So as we think about health inequities as differences, we think, I'm sorry, we think about health inequities as differences in health status between different population groups that arise due to avoidable and unjust policies and practices. These policies and practices create barriers and challenges to advantageous social determinants of health. What are social determinants of health? These are the conditions that people experience as they are born, as they grow, as they live, as they work, and as they age. They include economic stability, they include neighborhoods and physical environment, they include um, education, food, community and social context, and of course the healthcare system. So a few examples of each of these, so to give you an idea of what I'm talking about, when we talk about the social determinant of health as, re, as it relates to economic stability, we're talking about employment. What type of jobs people have, what is their employment status, we're talking about their income, we're talking about their wealth. 
the neighborhood and the physical environment concerns itself with adequate housing, availability of transportation, are there parks and playgrounds, and in general, is, there, is the neighborhood safe? Food, what are folks' ability to access quality food? Can they avoid hunger? From a community and social context, community engagement is so uh, incredibly important, as is uh, support systems. And, if, and then of course the healthcare system. Um, individuals need adequate quality and quantity of care and the, that care needs to be culturally competent. So as I said earlier, the challenges populations experience with regards to these social conditions is a major factor in poor health um, status. And in fact, that is what COVID-19 uh, pandemic has exposed. The fact that black residents make up about 11.5% of Missouri's population, but represent 30% of the cases and 35% of the deaths is exhibit one, that there are systemic differences in opportunities black residents have to stay healthy. Now, particularly as it relates to illness and death caused by COVID-19, I would point out a few that have had an avoidable and unjust impact. Take for instance, unsafe work environments. In particular, a lack of personal protective equipment. These individuals are in situations oftentimes, again, considered essential, uh, essential workers, and they've gone without masks or other types of um, equipment to protect their health. Those that work for lower wages find it difficult to maintain social distancing. They often don't have jobs that they can um, work from home. And so it puts them at increased risk of contacting, contracting uh, COVID-19. Poor housing conditions, again, um, incredibly dif difficult in many instances to social distance. And then the higher rates of chronic disease. And, and as was mentioned earlier, um, underlying diseases put you at increased risk for COVID-19. And then I don't want to um, leave out or avoid the fact that all of these issues are caused and or exacerbated by racism. So why do I say this? I'd like you to listen to this definition of, of racism offered by Dr. Kamara Jones. Dr. Kamara Jones is a leading expert on social determinants and racism. Dr. Jones says, racism is a system of structuring opportunity and assigning value based on the social interpretation of how one looks. That's what we call race. That unfairly disadvantages some individuals and communities, unfairly advantages other individuals and communities, and saps the strength of the whole society through the waste of human resources. So I offer to you what we are witnessing now is not the failure of individuals. It's not even just the failure of the healthcare system, but the failure of our society to promote the general welfare and secure the blessings of liberty for every individual. So thank you and I look forward to um, our discussion. Thank you to our panelists. And we already have a few questions in our Q&A and mm -hmm. our chat that I'm gonna to pose to the panelists because they directly relate to the opening remarks. And the first one, Dr. Hooks Anderson, you mentioned um, that we were now seeing an increase in younger cases of COVID-19 um, infection. But the um, question is, Yes, there is an increase in the um, number of cases, but the death rate was higher among um, older citizens, 65 and older. Is that still the case? Yes. Yes, the death rate is still higher um, in those persons who are older than age 60. And that is because of their underlying conditions. Um, so what we're finding, um, and uh, Ms. Holmes mentioned how uh, Blacks have this disproportionate um, 
rates that we're seeing in blacks as compared to whites as it relates to COVID uh, and particularly its deaths. Like an example would be um, if you look at places like uh, Chicago and Detroit where, um, you know, maybe the, uh, the population of blacks is a certain percentage, but they're three times more likely uh, to die from uh, COVID. So, and when we know that uh, what we find is that a lot of the people who are dying from COVID have underlying conditions like high blood pressure, diabetes, um, they have uh, autoimmune disorders uh, or some type of condition where their immune system is not as strong. So that's still the case. Um, but it's important to see that uh, the people who are now getting COVID though, I mean, that's changing because I, I feel, I feel not only just feel, I see uh, initially with this pandemic, we saw a lot of young people really have an attitude of, well, it's, it's the older people that are getting, these, uh, getting this virus. And uh, I live with a 20 year old and trying to get, you know, this demographic to see that, you know, COVID is not discriminating. Um, yes, the bulk of the people who are most sick are people with underlying conditions and who are older. But again, we saw that we had a rash of kids for a while in New York who were in the ICU from a mysterious illness that they were thinking that was related to COVID. And we also have to realize we don't know everything about COVID. I mean, every day there's something different. And that's been part of the problem. When COVID, when, when this really kind of hit the US, we really were playing catch up. So uh, we had one uh, group of recommendations to say, oh, you need to do this. Then that changed and said, oh no, that's not true anymore. Now you need to do this. So you have to realize we're learning uh, as we go along with this. And, and, and initially, we were looking at people who had traveled, people who had a cough. We then found out, hey, you can be asymptomatic and have COVID. You can have a rash and have COVID. You can have diarrhea and have COVID. So we have to realize that's why this particular virus is so dangerous in that sense, is that you can look fine, have COVID, be infectious, and could be spreading COVID to other people. So this is why um, I'm going, you're gonna hear me say multiple times on this panel, this is why social distancing, wearing your facial coverings and masks, hand washing is so important. Because again, it, it's, it's a silent, it's almost like a silent virus. Because again, you can have it and not realize it. Okay. Another question that came through, um, requested that the panelists um, speak to how physicians and healthcare providers should engage women of color, given the fact that um, health disparities have always existed and um, COVID-19 is simply exacerbating the disparities that we've seen. How should healthcare providers be engaging women of color and preventive screenings, health behaviors um, to improve potential health and health outcomes? So I'll start. Um, so I look at this as, um, I, I always have been preaching that uh, prevention is uh, cheaper than treatment. So um, working on encouraging people in our communities to um, exercise, eat five servings of fruits and vegetables every day, um, encouraging um, and advocating for workplaces to um, offer uh, benefits. And many companies do now where you get uh, so many points for getting your cholesterol checked. Um, getting checked for diabetes, um, for exercising. Um, and so we need more companies to join uh, on board with things like that, to encourage us as a baseline so that we can prevent hypertension, we can prevent diabetes, we can prevent obesity. Because all of three of those things, that those conditions that I just mentioned are all risk factors for COVID. And uh, the bottom line, the bulk of the people who come to the doctor more uh, on a regular basis are women. 
And so, and women are taking care of their families or taking care of their communities. So yes, we need to um, do a better job of caring for our, um, our female patients because they do a lot, a, a bulk of the work for their families. And just by those three conditions that I mentioned, high blood pressure, diabetes, and obesity, uh, prevention is cheaper than treatment. Other panelists with comments. I, I would just add, I think one of the important things and one of the overlooked things within our healthcare system is culturally competent care. Uh, making sure that those that prov are providing care um, understand the culture and the context, context with which um, patients present themselves so that they can do it in a way that it, um, engage, it, um, encourages trust and um, respect for that with that individual. So um, culturally competent care is important. The, the more um, health care providers that look like um, the patients, I think, is um, also an area for improvement. So as we can increase minority, minority professionals in these, um, in these situations, I think that will also benefit um, that issue. I would also add to that that another way we can engage Black women is to, to be aware of some of the issues that they struggle with, like Dr. Hooks Anderson said um, about obesity diet, and we know that there are going to be higher rates of African-American women who are suffering with these things. So one of these things we can do is to acknowledge that, ask the right questions. We can probe a little bit better. We can be a little bit more assertive with our questioning and our suggestions and encouragement for the correct behavior. And I do agree with Kathleen in that when it is a lot easier when you have culturally competent providers. So if you're sitting across the table or the the room for from a person that looks like you, you're going to instantly be more likely to trust that person and probably be more instantly likely to follow the direction of that person. So all of these things go hand in hand. And that doesn't mean that non African American providers can't be culturally competent, they can be, but it takes a lot of work on their part to do so. And they have to know a lot about the people and the communities that they serve in order to really develop a good rapport with them. Okay, thank you. I'm going to move to some of the questions that were um, submitted with um, registration now. And the first one is, we have one participant who wants to know more about the continuous impact of racial microaggressions within the healthcare system and what's <laughs> being done to acknowledge and prevent microaggressions in the healthcare system. So we know from research that um, racism uh, is contributing to poor health. Um, so people who have been uh, discriminated against, who have had acts of uh, racism um, uh, against them, and Dr. Jamika has talked about this a little bit, um, have problems with increased anxiety, depression, uh, they're distrustful of the healthcare system, and in order for these things to change, the healthcare system itself has to change. So I work at an academic institution and it is our job to train the next generation of healthcare providers, whether that are, those are the techs, the nursing staff, the physician staff. And we have to do a better job of um, interweaving um, social determinants of health, uh, information about structural and systemic racism throughout the education. We can't just give our students a 30-minute lecture on systemic and structural racism or simply just talk about the Tuskegee experiment and think that they they got it. Um, that's, that's, a, that's a poor job. So we have to do a better job of having people uh, understand the communities in which they serve. So I agree, it's a problem. Um, and it will not be fixed until we change how we educate our students and actually put resources and time and commitment behind doing such. Dr. Fafna. Okay, I, I wanted to kind of tie into that. When uh, Dr. Hooks Anderson mentions resources behind that, 
like what would that look like? What does that look like? So I can speak about in mental health, that would look like putting more um, people of color, faculty and uh, clinical directors and training sites that are training the, the next generation of mental health practitioners. It looks like giving them experience and exposure working with people of color and knowing what to do in those situations. So it, it will take a lot of work. A lot of that is hiring. Some of it is, is training. And then what does the training look like? You know, there was a big, big talk some time ago with police officers specifically about implicit bias training. And what we know now is that that hasn't really been effective. So for officers, if we give them the training and, and we realize, yes, we found out you have implicit bias, what does that do to the, it, it doesn't change the way they work in the field. It doesn't change the way they police communities. So it has to be a little bit more aggressive of an effort. We have to put people in real life situations where they can work with the people that they will later be working with. And we have to evaluate them on how they work with those people, the same way you would do with any other skills. Like for a medical doctor, if you are in medical school and you learn to intubate someone and you can't intubate someone, you don't finish that part of the course. And it needs to be that way in all other areas. If you cannot prove effectively that you can work with these populations, then you won't pass or you won't graduate or you won't whatever the, the outcome is. There has to be some type of performance and evaluation and assessment tied to what we are saying these values are. Um, we also had a question. People of color don't see many providers who, are, who look like them or who are other people of color. What can institutions do to inform and monitor white healthcare providers' attitudes and behaviors that are unconsciously alienating people of color? And I think it's related to the earlier. Right, right. I was just gonna say, uh, it's similar to my uh, previous comment, is that um, they also need to be working with people of color. So, um, you know, the training, uh, we, we have to do a better job in training. So uh, what we know is that like our current workforce, I can tell you, it, they do not get enough training in um, discrimination, structural and systemic racism, uh, and social determinants of health. We're doing a better job, but we're not doing, uh, it's not adequate. And what we find, like for, for instance, if you look at an academic institution, um, probably only about 4% or less of faculty are African-American. And that's in a, uh, they could even be in a population where the people around them make up uh, like 40 to 50% of the population, yet you still have this tiny percentage of faculty that are African-American. So in the medical community, only about 5% of the physicians nationwide in the US are African-American, yet we make up about 13 to 14% of the population. For Hispanics, they make up about 16% of the population. Again, only about 5% are physicians. That's a problem. So you need uh, people who are educating the next generation to look like uh, what our country is going to look like. Um, and they need to be working with these other providers. Because again, when you are working, with, if, if your surgical team looks like the country, first of all, you are going to be called out when you make comments that are inappropriate. You are more likely to be called out. You're more likely to be um, brought, brought to your attention that look, these are inappropriate comments. What you say to this patient is inappropriate. And again, that type of cultural uh, competency and sensitivity will only happen if, like Dr. Jamika said, it's constant training um, and it's being brought to their attention where there's some serious consequences if you're not um, getting better from how you've been treating these patients. So we just haven't gotten to that point in our education and in our healthcare system yet. Yet, um, it's a must. I mean, we see the upheaval in our country right now from not having people understand um, uh, the different cultures that represent our country. Uh, that's a problem. Not understanding uh, their part, what they played in producing this type of uh, inequity in our society. So we see it, we see it playing out right now. 
and the healthcare system is no different than um, the general population. Uh, yes, there are problems and we need to address it ASAP. And if I could, if I could just add um, to that, I think um, at the heart to um, leaders of these institutions need to identify uh, a uh, equitable goal, a racial equitable goal. What is it that we want to see happen? And then all of their practices and policies and procedures can be structured in such a way to um, meet that goal. And I think um, without that, you have um, sort of siloed uh, impact across institutions that doesn't, um, you know, uh, become fully um, appreciated throughout the whole institution. So I, I really think having that goal at the institutional level is really um, highly important. I have two questions for Dr. Falconer. Um, one is, how do you see racial inequities affecting the delivery of mental health? And we also have someone who wanted to know, um, beyond PTSD, um, what are you seeing with um, suicidal ideation and attempts um, during this period? Okay, um, well, the first part, um, which was about the delivery of services. Mm -hmm. um, I feel like racial um, equalities or inequalities impact that a great deal because like Dr. Hooks just said about the number, the percentage of physicians nationwide that are African-American, for psychologists, that number is even a little bit smaller than that. The numbers right now say about 4%. Well, that was a few years ago. It was 4% of all psychologists in this country are African-American. And given that we are, you know, 14, 15% of the population, we should expect to see more black psychologists, but we don't. There are a limited amount of those. So racial inequality affects who's delivering the services. Uh, race uh, affects how we deliver services. So like we've been talking about already, which is the culturally competent therapists or practitioners, that, that really makes a big impact with that. So what we've already shown just with the numbers is that if it's only 4% of us nationwide, more than likely, whatever community you live in across this country, there is not going to be enough black psychologists to go around. Yes, we'll also have social workers and, and master's level counselors in those areas. But even if you put all those together with the mental health needs that we have now, it wouldn't be enough to go around. So another way that race impacts the delivery of services is that if you have a population that is traumatized and has been the victim of generations of racism, oppression, discrimination, then you send these same people to people who have done the traumatizing. What does that do? If you send them to the wrong practitioner who is not culturally competent, it's going to re-traumatize them. It's going to add additional trauma to that person and it's not going to help them. So you're going to see things like people, we mentioned microaggressions earlier. So you, they walk into a practitioner's office who may be white and, and not experienced with people of color. And the first question they get mm -hmm. is, uh, can you pay for this? Can you pay for this session? Do you have insurance? How are you going to pay for it? How did you get here? We don't live, my office is not by a bus line. So when you go in an office and hear those type of things that automatically sets you apart and, and sets up this tension that will make it impossible for you to get your needs met. So race and inequalities affect service delivery of mental health in so many different ways. And the big way that it impacts it is that if in your community you don't have enough practitioners or that you know you have practitioners who are not competent, you're not going to go and seek help. So we're going to have people out here who are suffering with mental health issues and will feel as though there's nowhere they can go to seek help. What if you think of suicidal ideation? Um, I would say during COVID-19, I haven't seen a lot of cases of suicidal ideation. I just see much higher levels of depression and anxiety. Now, you know, of course, we know that if you're anxious to a certain extent, if you're so, so, so anxious, that could eventually trigger some type of suicide, but it's a specific type of personality where that would happen with. Mostly people are just kind of self-medicating, honestly. Okay. Dr. Hook Sanderson, you wanted to get in. Well, I was just going to say, and we have to like call out call out the racism. Um, like what I often find frustrating is that, you know, our students don't learn that the American Medical Association, for example, did not allow black physicians to be members. 
nor did they allow women uh, initially. So to me, in order for you to get better, uh, you need to also understand where we've come from. So I, I feel like you, you need to learn the history so that when you have a patient who you, you are calling non-compliant, uh, maybe there's a reason they're not taking their medication. Maybe there's a reason that they don't trust you. Um, and so examples of, you know, uh, our students are taught to you know, ask people uh, what they want to be called, or or they'll say things like, "Can I call you George?" Well, you know, you're in a position of power. So if you walk into a room and ask someone, "Can I call you George?" More than likely, they're going to say yes. But what you don't realize that George is 85 years old and from Mississippi. So it's a sign of disrespect to call a grown man by his first name. So again, if you don't have uh, trainers or faculty to teach those types of things, to understand that, you know, that's probably not what you should start out calling him. Because again, um, that, that type of, you know, you, you may not start out with a good relationship doing that. So again, you know, you need people there to be able to educate uh, our trainees uh, about how to take care of the patients, you know, in their, um, in their purview. So we just need to do a better job of that. We need to do a better job of teaching them the, the, the structural and institutional racism that is there. Like for me, I, I am suggesting to my school that it needs to be required reading, that all the students need to read something like Medical Apartheid. That, they, that needs to be a book that everybody, if you want to come to this institution, you need to read that book because they need to understand this is what happens to people at our hands so that we don't repeat those same mistakes. I'm gonna ask two questions that I'm linking and then I'm gonna go back to some of the COVID specific questions that are coming through the chat. One, what are some of the unique adversities un underrepresented um, individuals face in St. Louis? And then the second I think is related to this why did it take so long to get COVID-19 resources to North, North City and North County African-American communities? I, I can start, um, it, particularly in regards to um, getting resources to North St. Louis. I think, you know, at the heart of it, it was preparedness. Um, and it was preparedness that affected um, across the state. But in particular, when you have a community who has um, so many um, conditions that would put them at risk for experiencing adverse um, impact uh, related to COVID-19, there should have been some, there should be uh, some appreciation for the um, added resources that community is going to need in order to um, maintain. So I think um, preparedness, I would also um, point out that I think our um, cooperative muscle is a little underused in St. Louis. We tend to, um, you know, work in com competition as, a, as uh, opposed to, to cooperate. And um, certainly a pandemic um, experience is an opportunity to, to cooperate. And so it took a bit of time to um, sort of um, remember to use that muscle. And I think that that is, is certainly happening. And, and um, you know, we're certainly um, trying to help that um, happen, but folks have to um, cooperate. And it, and it, and it is uh, advantageous to have those networks and relationships built and ready to go be primed when they're needed. It. Um, and so I think that that's uh, uh, absolutely one of the reasons why resources weren't there when they were needed. And, and thank you, Kathleen. Um, I, I think that was a very kind answer. Um, <laughs> and uh, I, I guess for me, uh, I, I would still say structural and systemic racism. Um, because I, I found it very strange initially that most of the testing sites were in affluent areas initially. Um, and I brought that to the attention of people that I knew um, that why was this happening? Um, I've actually kind of coined a phrase called necromedicine. And it just it seems to me that, um, and if you look at any, um, any um, health condition or situation, you even look at, the, the pandemic, the flu pandemic in 1918, it's the same situation. 
um, Blacks um, had um, little access to economic uh, opportunity. Uh, they lived in poor areas, uh, poor sanitation uh, in those areas. So what happened in 1918 is hardly any different than 2020. Uh, so necromedicine, meaning that um, if you're deliberately not giving enough resources to a certain group of people where they end up with poor conditions and death, necromedicine, where it's almost, uh, it's almost uh, and appears intentional. Um, and that may not have been the case, but if the same thing is happening from 1918 to 2020, please explain to me why is this still happening? And if, if I could add to that point, a point that I really wanted to make um, today, so thank you for giving me an opportunity to do that. I think um, one of the reasons why we have such poor outcomes oftentimes is because we believe in, there's some myths, there's some myths that support some behaviors. And one of those myths is a zero sum game, gain that is, that is if, if I, I, if you gain, I lose. And I think that that's, um, it's not correct. It's not the right way to think about things. Um, there's a gain to society when everyone is able to achieve optimal health. So to uh, think about how resources are allocated, it makes sense to allocate resources to those who need it most in order for all of society to gain. And so I just wanted to, and thank you again for that opportunity. I wanna quickly get in two specific COVID questions and then move us along a little bit more. One was how long can you have and be contagious? And two was what, what are the current guidelines for um, athletes going back to um, start summer training and practicing? So those, those are good questions that I think we're still working through. So, you know, what we're saying to people is that, you know, if you have been exposed potentially exposed to COVID, that you should self-quarantine for about 14 days. But, you know, what does that mean? Because, you know, there are cases where people have um, had the infection and five weeks later are still testing positive for COVID. So, it, you know, right now what we're saying is just 14 days. Um, but again, also understanding that the antibody tests that are out there, um, uh, they're not great tests. So we're not even sure if we're doing any good by having people even get uh, tested, getting an antibody test to see if they've been exposed. And we don't even know what that means. So even if you've been exposed and your antibodies are positive, does that mean that you're immune and that you can't get it again? All of these questions, we don't know yet. And so the research is still going on. Now, as it relates to athletes, so I, you know, a lot of uh, teams have been slowly trying to get back out there and they're trying to figure out how they're going to be socially distant. But we have to also um, understand, and you can even look at the examples of the NBA players, a few of them more are being, are testing positive. Um, so, again, we have to be careful uh, because, again, you don't, you, you don't know who other people are being exposed to. So, you know, you may be careful, but you don't know that this person um, has other family members that work in fast food or they have to be in a, a public uh, a type of place where they're being exposed on a constant basis or they work in healthcare. So, again, there are all of these different variables that we don't know and it's making it very difficult because I know all of us are anxious to get back to our regular activities. Our kids are, are bouncing off the walls. They need to get out. They need exercise. They've not been able to do their summer camps. But again, you need to find places where hopefully they can be outdoors, where they can be socially distant uh, or play a sport where they don't have to be uh, on top of each other like basketball or something like that or football where they're all clustered together but it, it makes it difficult so i don't think we have great answers dr thompson uh to those questions thank you i'm going to try to link a few questions and get us through three more before we run out of time so 
Um, one question that came in is, are the disparities we see an issue of socioeconomics or policy? How do we as a whole eliminate, the, eliminate disparities? Other countries have done this and why not us? And someone also asked a kind of related question, do African Americans comprise a greater percentage of essential workers who are underinsured and uninsured um, when, and when they're sick or penalized for taking off? I would, uh, I, I can't give you percentages, but that is um, absolutely an issue for um, for uh, people of color. Um, the the types, as was mentioned earlier, the types of employment, the um, the types of services that are being provided, um, the protection that is offered to those um, employees in those types of situations are absolutely um, impacting. I can't give you percentages. I'm not sure if anyone else has any a, a better better answer. So I, I don't have the exact percentages, but from what we could see from uh, the earlier cases um, early in the pandemic, so Blacks, blacks and uh, Latinos were the bulk of the essential workers, the, the grocery store workers, the, the home health aides, the nursing home um, aides. And yes, a lot of those jobs do not carry insurance. And for many employees, they were also very scared to even tell people if they had symptoms because they were afraid to lose their jobs. Because if you're living from paycheck to paycheck, um, you'd rather work uh, as a sick person than not to work. Uh, and that's what we saw also in the people that were working in the meat plants, um, that many of them did go to work uh, knowingly sick because they were afraid to lose their jobs uh, so because they, they couldn't take off. So are disparities a socioeconomic issue or a policy issue? Are health disparities a socioeconomic issue or policy issue? I think it's both. Mm -hmm. I think it's both. When you look at how policy determines how many, for behavioral health, how many session, sessions you get for therapy. Policy determines that. Uh, laws and rules of insurance companies, Medicare, Medicaid, determines how many sessions you get. If you can get uh, mental health therapy and for how long. And policy determines what issues they deem are necessary or crucial enough for you to seek help for and what they will pay for. Policy determines that. But socioeconomic status determines that as well. Um, so it determines what type of insurance you have, if you have insurance or not, how many sessions you get, if you can afford the copay. That's a socioeconomic issue, if you can afford the copay. Some people don't go to therapy because they can't afford the copay that goes with their insurance. Um, so there's so many issues. I think it's, it's a little bit of both. It's all, it's all connected and policies impact social economic issues. So, um, you know, it, it's about, it's about structures, it's about policies, it's about practices, it's about norms. And really in order to make impact on this issue, all of those have to be examined. All of those have to be looked at from a, um, an equitable um, frame and all of those have to be um, included in the equation um, to create the change that needs to happen. That links us to a final question that someone submitted. They posed um, the issue of Medicaid expansion, Medicare for all, um, and a, a universal standard of eliminating the tie between um, health insurance and employment. So, and, and how, does, how will this affect health disparities? Well, I think Medicaid expansion, at least in the state of Missouri, would help. Uh, when I think about healthcare, I think about mental health care. It would help with that because many of the people that need to receive mental health services are Medicaid recipients, and Medicaid only does so much and only covers so much. And um, what I've been told from many of my patients is when it comes to mental health, they search for months to find psychologists or social workers that accept Medicaid. And then many times when they go through a list that it takes them a week or two to call, then they finally get to one and then they realize that person no longer accepts Medicaid. So uh, there are a lot of issues that involve Medicaid coverage, yeah. but overall I do think expanding it would help more people receive services. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely Medicaid needs to be uh, expanded. 
And I think this argument about, you know, who should get health care, I mean, we've been fighting the semantics for a long time, but we also have to remember that when Medicare was on the table, that people fought against it too. Um, and organizations like the AMA uh, fought against uh, Medicare. So again, history is important. Um, so uh, yes, everyone having health care is something that is uh, important. You know, if you use the example of Medi uh, Medicaid, um, you know, we talk about the, um, the opioid uh, situation that's in our country. But for instance, if a person has back pain and have Medicaid, they can't get physical therapy. So they can't get a type of therapy uh, uh, that, so that we wouldn't have to give them some type of pain medicine. So that's a problem. So that's a problem if you can't offer a, a solution to a person's uh, pain other than a pain med because their insurance won't let them get it. So yes, um, Medicaid expansion, people having um, some form of health insurance so that they are not using the ER as their urgent care center or their primary care provider uh, is important. And, and I agree with everything that's been said. It's absolutely necessary, but I also say it's not sufficient. We've already talked about all of the other things that impact these health inequities and healthcare and access to healthcare is absolutely necessary, but we can't rest on our laurels once we have that. There's lots of other work to be done. Okay, I'm leaving about a dozen questions unanswered, but I'm gonna ask each of you to give a 30 second spiel very quickly. What can people on this um, webinar do to um, support racial um, equity to help bring down um, disparities in um, the healthcare environment? So I'll, I'll start. Um, we need to read. Um, we need to read books like Medical Apartheid by Harriet Washington. We need to read books like White Fragility by Robin DiAngelo. Um, we need to uh, understand that it isn't a Black and Latina problem. It's uh, an American problem that all, we are all in this together. Um, as it relates to COVID, um, I cannot say enough, and I told you I would say it multiple times, that this pandemic is not over. Um, we are expecting a, a surge um, in the fall. We have to realize in the fall, we're gonna have influenza and COVID at the same time. They both look alike, they smell alike, uh, they appear alike, so it's gonna be difficult. So um, don't forget your flu vaccine this fall, that's gonna be very important. Um, your facial coverings, uh, your mask, and your hand washing and using hand and I'm sanitizer. I'm gonna have to stop you because if I don't, important. Stop you, I'm not gonna get my other people in. <laughs> it's important. So, okay, I'm sorry, sorry, but that all, those are all the things that are important uh, that we should remember. Kathleen, explore your assumptions and bust your myths. Dr. Falconer. Um, for me, I would say some of the same things Dr. Hooks Anderson say, read, become informed. Uh, one, another book that I would recommend is How to Be an Anti-Racist by Ibram Kendi. Uh, that helps people really start to form what the next steps are as far as we can't, we have to go from this paradigm that we've all kind of grown up with and, and believe for many, many years and generations to moving to the next phase. What does this look like? What do we have to do to get there? And the last thing I want to say is seek help if you feel like you or someone you know is suffering from anxiety, depression, or trauma, try to reach out to the black psychologist or culturally competent therapist in the area that we have. And I'm gonna turn it over to Adrian Bracey to take us out. Wow, thank you ladies, great job. What a wonderful job. And I know that if the audience could could be here in person, they would give you a standing ovation and say thank you so very much. Information will be on the website. Uh, we will make sure that you get a survey. So please fill out your sur survey to our audience so that we can get your feedback. We do plan to have maybe two more town hall meetings. One will be on voting, the other one on the uh, education impact of COVID-19 on the education uh, of, of 
people of uh, kids of color, primarily our black kids. Uh, again, uh, please uh, be safe. Thank you so very much, the distinguished panelists. And you will get your email to our audience. You'll get a follow-up email with all the information, the resources that was given to you today. Thank you very, very much to everyone who attended. Be safe and be well. God bless. Thank you.